Awesome. Here's your first clicker. There we go. All right, welcome everyone. If you need seats, there's more seats down front. So if more students come in, send them down here, Josh. All right, welcome. Uh, my name is Professor Love. I am your host today uh, for our first, first year engineering seminar series. We have uh, some entre entrepreneurs and engineers, including two Northeastern graduates here to share their experiences with you. Uh, with, with a company called Tinkineer, which is now part of a company called Play Monster. So I will turn it over to Adam Hockerman. Hockerman, he's the founder of the company Tinkineer and also the vice president of new business for Play Monster. They're located in Beverly, Massachusetts, and they're going to share with you uh, how they use engineering um, in, their, in their product and the story of how they came to be. So I'll give it over to Adam. Um, as far as the, the purple slips, hang on to those until the end, and then we'll have a couple of bins on the outside when you leave. You just slip them into our little baskets. We'll collect them at the end of the seminar, and we'll get them to your professors, OK, or your um, other faculty members. So thanks. All right, here we go. Good afternoon. Thanks for joining us uh, inside on what's perhaps the nicest day of the fall. And um, what we're going to do today is uh, we're here representing a company called Play Monster, uh, which is the company that acquired uh, a company that I founded a couple of years ago. And we'll tell you a, bit, a little bit more about that. You may not have heard of Play Monster, but we're uh, you know a mid-sized toy manufacturing company based out of Wisconsin, and now with an adjunct uh, office in Beverly since the acquisition. We make all kinds of toys, games, party games, STEM toys, um, a lot of different things under a variety of names, some of which you've probably heard of, some of which you may not have. Uh, one of our the big brands we distribute is the is the old game Stratego, for example. You may have heard of that one. Um, we're going to spend about half an hour uh, introducing our background, a little bit of history about the company, a, 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 a quick um, uh, some quick background about uh, how we engineer and design our products, and then some information about how we manufacture them to try and give you guys, as new incoming uh, students, some context uh, about what you may uh, want to do one day. So I remember sitting in your exact shoes on my first day of engineering uh, some 20 years ago, 25 years ago, uh, not having any idea what was in store for me or really even what engineers did. So um, I'll, we'll start with me. Uh, I was born in 1975 in New York City. Uh, I grew up in, in Chappaqua, New York, and I was out of there long before that town would become the future home of Bill Clinton and his wife, Hillary. Um, I graduated in 1993, and in 1994, uh, I entered uh, Cornell University. And I, I went to engineering school because people said, well, what do you like to do? And I said, well, yeah, I like to tinker with things. And I'm, <clears throat> I'm pretty good at, at building things. And I invent some things. And, and I said, oh, well, you should go to engineering school. And that was about the long and the short of it. Today, you guys have a lot more, uh, you know, presumably, you guys have a lot more exposure and understanding of what it is that engineers do, and uh, you're much better prepared for the four-year curriculum that you're about to embark on. <clears throat> um, so I got into to engineering, and, and, I, and I quickly underestimated how much work it was. Uh, within six weeks, I was not attending <clears throat> my entry chemistry class, and I was about to fail it. So I dropped it, um, and, I, and I quickly uh, recovered from that. But you know, the lesson here is that you know, if Northeastern is anything like Cornell, and I'm sure it is, these early classes are, are very difficult. You're going to be, you know, have a lot of stuff thrown at you at once. Don't get overwhelmed. Um, the best of us do. I did. Uh, I muddled through it. And, you know, ultimately, uh, sort of that trial by fire was very good for me. 
1997, I graduated from Cornell uh, with a Bachelor's of Science in Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering. And at that time, jobs in uh, consulting were very hot. So, you know, at, th at that time, entry level consulting positions were basically computer programming jobs. We were inter integrating big ERP systems for giant corporations. That company is called Accenture today. Um, that I, was a great experience, but a couple of years into that, or maybe a year into that, these two guys from MIT wandered down uh, to the company to show us a technology they were working on, which was basically a digital aerial map and something exactly like what you would see on Google Maps today. But at the time, this was absolutely mind-blowing to me. I thought what they were doing was so cool. They had hand-built this, this Java applet from scratch. I'd never seen anything like it. It was coming out of the planning department in MIT. And I said, where do you guys work? And they said, we're in Cambridge. We work in this, in this basement, you know, this bug-infested basement. And I said, that's perfect. That's exactly what I want to do. And uh, not too long after that, about two years into my tenure in a big company, I left to join these three guys in the basement building this, this mapping application in a field called GIS, which is Geographic Information Systems. This is what today is the underpinning for uh, Google Maps and anything else that you see a digital map for. Um, that company was building uh, a municipal application, and it was not ultimately not successful, um, unfortunately. But by the end of it, in 2003, I was pretty burned out, and uh, I was fed up with software because I felt software was never done, and uh, I wanted to do something more tangible. So I had this idea for a product that I'll show you in a couple of slides called the Never Late. In, in my class, and it sounds like here, too, because I heard uh, Jennifer say that you guys have different schedules on Tuesday and Fridays. Well, at Cornell, it was Monday, Wednesday, Friday at one time, and Tuesday, Thursday at another time. And every single day, I had to change my alarm because I got up at 11. You know, I had a class at 11 on Tuesdays and Thursdays and 9 o'clock on Monday, Wednesday, Friday. So I invented this thing called the seven-day alarm clock, and that was the foundation for a company called American Innovative. Oops. Um, so uh, around the time that I thought of that, I applied to business school. And I started this company, thinking that one or the other of these things would work out. Well, as it turned out, I got accepted to business school, and the company was sort of beginning to take off. The idea had some, some legs. So I took the company to, to Ithaca, back to Ithaca with me, where I'd done my undergraduate, and I, I finished my MBA there. And in the midst of that, I launched, uh, I launched the company, and, um, and I built this line of products that I'll show you in a couple of slides. Uh, by 2009, after a couple of, uh, of missteps, this company was in danger of, of, of closing. And um, I decided, I woke up in the middle of the night one night, and I said to my wife, I'd made this terrible hiring decision. It was kind of the last straw. I said, I'm gonna, tomorrow I'm gonna, I'm gonna fire this guy, I'm gonna lay off the other employees that I have, and I'm gonna shut this down. Um, and that's what I did. But I didn't shut it down. Uh, what happened was suddenly one of the products that I had developed, which was a children's product, began to take off as the recession was forging along. And so, I mean, this was a bad time for those of you, you know, who have heard or are old enough to remember. But this product was kind of taking off, and then I was running this company that had no overhead. So suddenly I, the company was doing really well because it's this balance between revenue and expenses, right? So that actually wound up working out really well. Um, in the midst of this, I, I moved to the North Shore. I got married. I had a couple of children. And in 2014, I sold a company. Um, so I had this, this uh, digital electronics company that was manufacturing things in Asia. And uh, the time seemed right. And I sold the company to a company called Patch Products. Uh, that company would ultimately change their name to Play Monster. At the time, I had an idea for the, for, the, for, the, for the product line that you'll see today, Marvelocity. And I told the company about the premise. And they were kind of lukewarm on it. They said, you know what? Go do what you're going to do. And when you get back, you know, when you get it to a certain point, show it to us, and we'll talk again. Well, you know, long story short, by the time I launched it, they wanted it. And subsequently, I sold that company also to the same company. And the second time around, they said, well, Maybe we should hire this guy. Um, so I came on as part of the management team today. I'm the vice president of new business. I, my, my role is broader than it was. Um, and uh, y y so I get to dabble in other things besides my, my original product line, although a lot of what I do uh, has to do with the continued development and propagation of, of the toys that you'll see today. Um, 
the you know in between there, uh, I had this great inspiration <clears throat> when wondering how to manufacture this thing. We work with a local company in Beverly called Goddard uh, Design. They're a mechanical engineering and design firm. You may have you may have heard of them, or you may want to hear of them. They have many uh, many many Northeastern graduates there. Very talented. One of the best engineers I've ever worked with came right out of Northeastern. He is incredible. And um, and they were talking about hiring a co-op, and maybe we we're going to, you know, maybe we, were, we would we would share some hours. And ultimately, they decided not to do that. And I said, wait a minute, these co-ops sound valuable. They're relatively inexpensive. I can do that. And so I hired Ayush, and um, that was the best decision I ever made because it really made, you know, it set the course for the rest of the company's history uh, between then and now. And with that, I'm going to hand uh, the microphone off to him so he can tell you a little bit about his background. Thank you, Adam. Uh, so a uh, little bit about my background. I did my undergrad in India in industrial engineering. I did a couple of jobs after that, but nothing that really inspired me. So I thought, uh, while I'm in my 20s, this is a good time to uh, learn more and make the most of it. So I decided to apply for grad school just three weeks before uh, I found out what, what the application deadlines were. And uh, I came across the, the engineering management program at Northeastern which seemed uh, like a very good balance of uh, a, a very good bridge between uh, uh, technical and uh, analytical knowledge from engineering, as well as learn some management and business skills uh, and, and develop more business acumen. So that seemed perfect for me. And uh, as, uh, as I got into Northeastern, uh, I was always inspired by the entrepreneurship uh, spirit that was around the campus in general. Uh, a few specifics that I thought were uh, the the, uh, the courses offered uh, in, in the engineering school and the business school. I did the technological entrepreneurship courses at the business school were pretty good. Uh, they got us together with all the different resources, went us uh, take us through a complete product development of a product. They uh, literally made us push for our own product and go out there and try to do it. We uh, they took us to the Mass Art College to connect us to some, uh, through some industrial designer, uh, connected us through the, uh, the different mechanical engineering. If you have a software product, they connected us to the software development uh, uh, groups uh, at Northeastern, which really helped. And uh, yeah, uh, and, there, uh, and all the other things that, that goes around at Northeastern, like the Idea Lab, uh, where you get professor, mentors, uh, the, uh, uh, all the business school professors, they have a bunch of connection they bring to the table. So it's a good experience. And at the end of that idea lab, if you really have a good product, you get prototype fundings of sales. I think it was $1,000 at that time. And uh, and $1,000 gives you something to start. And if you really build a good project, a really good case, you could apply for a gap fund of uh, $10,000 that could uh, really give you that small kickstart uh, on the project that you want to do. And while I was going through uh, all these things for the products that I was working for, in my business school uh, classes, I came across uh, this job post for Tinkineer. And uh, I thought, uh, between all these makes, we always talk about Kickstarter for crowdfunding. And, uh, and Tinkineer was launched through a Kickstarter. I saw, uh, I thought it's perfect. It's, uh, it's everything that we are learning. It's everything that we are doing. And the company is in that phase. Uh, the product that I was working on was, uh, I was not 100% confident about the future of that product. But this looked promising to me, so yeah. I started my co-op in that company and uh, never left after that and started full-time right after graduation. Uh -huh. Hey, everyone. Uh, I'm also Ayush. Uh, I, I for actually joined Northeastern in 2015, so I did my undergrad from India. I have a degree in mechanical engineering. After my graduation from un from India, I just wanted to take a break. But instead, I just came here, applied for grad school, because why not? Uh, at Northeastern, I wanted to really focus my cu curriculum around you know, uh, statistics, process improvement, also get hands-on learning at the same time. So co-op was a big factor for me choosing Northeastern. And like Ayush, I stumbled upon Tinkineer. The company was growing. There was a lot of different responsibilities to take on. You you had a 
the chance to grow in every direction. So I chose to join them. Rather, Adam hired me. And uh, like, yeah, never left after that. I joined full time too this past June. Uh, I graduated Northeastern with a master's in industrial engineering. Thank you. Um, well, you know, we, I couldn't be luckier to have these two guys. Uh, I mean, it's just amazing. Uh, you know, I put them into roles well beyond what would be expected of a new graduate, even at a graduate level at Northeastern, and they just rose to the occasion. I mean, and so I presume that that is, has something to do with the school that you're all attending. So, you know, feel good that you're in the right place. Um, so I'm going to, you know, so as not to dwell too long on any one slide, because we have a bunch of them, I'm just going to whip through some of the things that I've <clears throat> done in my past so you can get an idea of how we got from point A to point B. In 2003, I designed this product, uh, which is called the Never Late Seven Day Alarm Clock. Uh, it was relatively successful. I had this serendipitous first sale into a big company called Linens and Things, <clears throat> which was like a, a terrible version of Bed Bath & Beyond. Um, <laughs> for those of you that remember, uh, that company went bankrupt not long after that. Um, I got lots and lots of feedback about this product. Why doesn't it do this? Why doesn't it do that? So that spawned this product, which did everything. Um, I didn't know as much about user interface design back then as I do today. And I kind of stuck all the features into this one big product that, you know, like most of the names of my products, I just thought up one day, called it the Neverlate Executive, and it stuck. We still get a call or two a week about this product and why it doesn't exist on the marketplace. Some five or seven years ago, I decided that Smartphones have probably displaced this item. Alas, there still seems to be some market for it. Take that for what you will. Um, then I had this factory in China that made clock type things, and I had this, this apparatus on the front, this dial, which I actually uh, secured a patent for. And I said, well, what else can I make? All right, I said, all right, well, let's make a kitchen timer. So this product's called the Chef's Quad Timer Professional. It's my favorite product of all time. It's still on sale today, uh, over 10 years after I launched it. You can get it at Amazon. Um, I, I, I like this product because it kind of does what it's supposed to do. It's a, four, it's a four burner stove timer, and it has these little icons on the front, the LEDs that you see there, that show you which, which timer corresponds to which stove. So it was an innovation that I created to make what was on the market was typical single or triple timers that were, that were kind of clumsy and their aesthetic was not great and they were hard to use. So I made an improvement on that and it spawned this product and it's been one of my favorites because I don't hear much about it. It just kind of does its thing. Customers seem to like it. You hear from customers when they don't like it. Um, so this is, the comp this is the product that almost undid the company. <clears throat> so right before the, the recession, um, I, had a, I had hired a, a good vice president of engineering, and we were thinking about what we wanted to do next, and we decided to, to develop th uh, this product, which was called the PBA. It stood for Personal Baby Assistant. And what it did, it was for new moms to collect information about what my baby was eating, when they were sleeping, when they were pooping, what kind of pooping. Um, one day you'll understand that this is something that new parents actually care about. <clears throat> and there is actually a need for this, and today there are apps that do this. But at the time, the iPhone was just coming on the scene. It wasn't, you know, the apps weren't what they were today. And we were like, you know what? We're a hardware company. This is what we do. So we developed this, this product. It was only $50, connected to, the web, to a website. It did charts and data and graphs. And it had this handheld device with the digital display. And it worked pretty well. In fact, uh, my wife is probably one of about the six customers that actually ever bought this. And she, she really, uh, she, she made me dig it out for our second daughter when she was born. Unfortunately, because of the recession and you know a, a variety of other external factors, the rise of the iPhone and so forth, this product wasn't commercially successful. And it was around that time that uh, I made a hire. I had a I had a high expense structure because my my vice president of engineering was a was a, an expensive MIT slash Stanford design grad. I said, I know what I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to hire an expensive salesperson to raise revenue in order to cover these expensive engineers. Um, Unfortunately, that salesperson was kind of a charlatan and uh, wasn't doing anything. And that's when I woke up in the middle of the night and I said, oh my god, this is a disaster. And so that's, that's where that turn of events came. But meanwhile, I had invented this product. So this is a children's product called the Teach Me Time. And it features a, 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 a glowing light. Um, it's not shown in this photo, but it, the housing glows yellow as a night light uh, in the evening. And in the morning, it turns green when it's OK for your child to get out of bed. Now, again, hopefully, this is not something that many of you are familiar with. Uh, but children tend to get out of bed in the middle of the night. They don't know what time of day it is, particularly in the winter when it's dark at 4 o'clock and also, you know, when you wake up in the morning. So this green light feature became very successful 
And you know, this is a cute product, and it also, it also had a game that teaches you how to tell time on the analog and digital clocks, which apparently works very well, because years and years later, I taught my four-year-old how to tell time, uh, which was really cool. You know, it took many years before I got to really maximize the benefits of some of my own products. This was the product that saved the company and that took off while um, you know, I was in the middle of trying to close the company. This is sort of just a little niche item that I really like. Um, some years ago, I fell upon these, these, these antique display units, which are called Nixie tubes. And uh, they are what pre preceded uh, LED displays. They come out of Russia. They're filled with neon or argon gas. And they're really beautiful. And uh, I hand built a bunch of clocks uh, that look like this um, at one point. Very expensive product, but I didn't sell very many of them. It wasn't the point. It was sort of like a labor of love. OK, so <clears throat> on to, uh, I guess this is around 2014. This is the, the origin story of, of the company Tinkineer. Um, we, you know, it's, it's now a whole different time. Like when I did the, the clocks and things, uh, you know, hardware as a thing was, you didn't do it. Like what we were doing was very difficult and very innovative. Uh, today, you know, there's lots and lots of buzz about hardware. Um, and along comes Kickstarter. So this time around, I'm like, you know what? This is so much fun. I love tracking these Kickstarters. I backed a whole bunch of them. I wonder what it'd be like to be a, to, to be a creator. Um, so uh, I took with me one employee from my previous company, Krista Jake. She's sitting right there. Um, she's like my anchor who has you know, helped us through all of these many exciting things that we have done. And she and I put together this Kickstarter video. It's only about three minutes. I, I guess we'll, we'll watch it because I think it's, you know, it's, a good, it's a good way to give you a background. Marvelocity is an educational maker kit experience. The modules build up into dynamic wooden structures that we call marble machines. It's a kit that starts from you know just a little package and you build it up into this kind of living, working uh, system that has all these different parts and facets to it. Tinkineer's Marvelocity line is designed to teach engineering and physics concepts to preteens, teens, and even adults Tinkineer's line is designed around a comprehensive two-pronged approach. There is a very robust storyline that's told through a cast of characters that we call the Tinkineers, and we tell the stories in graphic novella format to help children and parents understand the concepts and have fun to feel connected to the lessons that we're teaching. And then those lessons are reinforced through a substantive project, a maker craft that builds a beautiful marble machine. For example, the first module, which we call the roller coaster module, is designed to communicate a lesson about conservation of energy. We have a vision for the Marvelocity product line, and this Kickstarter allows us to get started with it. In the future, we'd like to develop more and more exciting Marvelocity modules. The money from our Kickstarter campaign will be used to buy additional production equipment so that we can cut more Marvelocity kits at a faster rate. We'll also use the additional funds to advance the product development on other Marvelocity modules, bringing you things like a skate park or an amazing race. I think this is an interesting application of a very natural, simple material, and you're actually making it into a working machine. The finished Marvelocity coaster is a beautiful piece of kinetic art. It's substantive and it looks great in natural wood sitting on a shelf, in your child's bedroom, on a table. We've designed the Marvelocity kit to be a really satisfying building experience. Because we're doing with the wood and the laser cutter, that combination has allowed us to constantly tweak and improve the design. The product that we've developed, the Tinkineer line, is really about giving children and even adults an interactive craft maker experience that teaches and reinforces engineering and physics concepts. If you've been inspired by watching the Marvelocity product line in action and you feel the same way that we do about bringing this exciting new STEM product to market, we really hope that you'll support us by backing our Kickstarter project. Thank you.
All right, so that's the origin story. Um, it's fun filming those scenes where the engineers are talking to one another because they're reenactments. So we're supposed to be talking about STEM, but we're really going, well, what would you do last weekend? Because we don't know what to talk about. We just have to have our lips moving. Um, so this, this was, uh, the, the part we left out was that, you know, we, I wanted to make this in America. I was, I was, I had a very good experience manufacturing items in China, um, but I was fatigued and I wanted to make it in the U.S. I was like, no problem, we'll just do it the same way, except instead of outsourcing it to a factory in, Amer in, in, in uh, China, we'll, we'll outsource it to a factory in America. And I tried to do that. Uh, you can't do that. It's not, it's not, there are not, this is one of the problems in why so many things have moved to, to overseas. There are not shops set up to do high capacity laser cutting in America. So I was like, well, no problem. I, you know, I was looking at these machines and like, they look pretty simple. They run on, on 110, you know, the, I, like, I, so I called up the manufacturer and said, What's, what am I missing here? What is expensive about running this machine? Why does it cost so much to have this done externally? They're like, nothing. You know, there's nothing complicated. I'm like, great. So we'll take one and you know, we'll set up a factory. That was a humongous oversimplification of what was to come. And I'm going to let these guys uh, <laughs> tell you about it in a little bit. Um, before I do that, it was very important to Jennifer that I <clears throat> talk about some of the um, ups and downs of how this product got developed. Um, okay, we can, let's see, if I can, okay, we'll skip this slide. I've got a couple more videos in here, but we're running a little bit short on time. You can view these uh, other sort of product highlight videos on YouTube if you so desire. Um, one, one interesting point here. So in the midst of doing the Kickstarter, you know, I'm a product guy. I've, you know, spent a lot of time thinking about the, the client need or the customer need, in this case, the customer need. It all has to do with, with price points and price sensitivity. So this was going to be a 50 or $60 item. And like halfway through our development of this before the Kickstarter, I was like, I got cold feet. I was like, you know what? We, we need like a $30 price point. We need an entry level price point. Um, and that was a brilliant move, actually, because that spawned what we call the mini series. These guys cost $30. Uh, to date, these are really our bread and butter, the smaller models. They're, they're more accessible. They're easier for the consumer. They're easier for the retailer to bring in because they don't have as much anxiety about, well, I don't know if a customer is going to pay X amount of dollars for a more expensive item. So, um, you know, you always want to keep your client, your customer in mind when you're developing a, when you're developing a product. You want to understand the whole range of what it's going to cost to what your retail is going to be and what all the margins are going to be in between in order to get it done. So that's the full product line uh, to date. And we have two new models on the way. Uh, nobody's seen this yet, or very few people have seen this. This is going to be our even lower price model. And the way we're achieving this is by integrating some very basic plastics into these items. Uh, the, ba the, the heavy cost. Uh, what, what, what costs a lot in these models is not the wood, it's the time. So even though the laser cutter is relatively automated, you know, we, the, the time it takes to make the laser cutter equates to direct, to direct costs, which in America are expensive. And so the amount of cutting is what largely drives the price point. So in order to do something complex, like the lift mechanism, which we previously, previously built entirely out of laser cut wood, this time we're going to do it out of plastic. So that eliminates a whole lot of cutting, and we're able to bring a very similar looking product to market, uh, but we're able to make it for less money and bring it to the consumer for a slightly lower price point. This is uh, the second one in that series. We call these the triple play. There's going to be three of them. They'll, they'll connect to one another. They can be motorized. All right, so the origin story or the, 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 the engineering design process, this is literally like the first sketch of <clears throat> that dragon coaster. Uh, you know, the concept was, look, there were marble machines on the market. There's always going to be on the market something similar to what, to, what you, to what you've built before. There were not marble machines on the market. There were marble ramps. You could go to YouTube and find people that had cobbled together things in their garage or whatever. My, th what was different about my idea was that it was going to be something you could build yourself and you'd be able to combine them. And the ultimate vision was to have actually nine of these combined. Ultimately, uh, we settled on four, and today there are two, which do actually interact with one another, the two large models. So early on, or this is what the finished product looked like, but early on, you know, a lot of iteration. So this is like the second thing we ever laser cut. You know, a sort of a proof of concept of this bevel gear arrangement made out of wood. <clears throat> Uh, using metal pins that later on I'll talk about, you know, we would eliminate uh, because they're expensive and they were difficult for the user to install. Um, this is like the first example of, of something that we did with tracks to see how that worked. Uh, tracks wound up being a neat aesthetic feature, but the problem with tracks is that they're long and windy and that results in lots of laser cutting. So, you know, these are things we learned as we went along. 
This is an early prototype. You can see, I mean, it looks very similar to what we ultimately arrived at, but it's not. It's, it's very different. Like, look how deep the, the dips are. This was like literally like, you know, we drew a line in CAD and we'll say, let's see how that works. Like, there's no, there's, there is science, but it, it would take, it would cost tens of thousands of dollars to mathematically figure out the perfect ramp structure, right? So instead, we cut one out. It doesn't work. We cut out another one. We cut out another one until it works. That's, that, you know, that's largely how the iterative process works. So you know what we do, unlike a lot of, like there are more technical companies that you're going to be exposed to, but we, what we do is very similar to what you're doing in um, you know, your introductory engineering class, that the Cornerstone series. It's, it's not so dissimilar. There's a lot of iteration. There's a lot of hands-on stuff that we do. Um, here's another shot of that model kind of under evolution. We originally had this idea that I scrapped. Um, I really like it conceptually, but the idea was that these models would connect to one another with a shaft drive. So you'd only have to connect a motor to one of them and it would power the entire apparatus. Now that might be true if you had, you know, steel ball bearings and other things to reduce friction and, and your consumer that was building it was a trained professional engineer and not a 12 year old boy or girl. Um, ultimately, that didn't prove to it did it worked, but it, it didn't prove to work well enough for a consumer-oriented product. So we eliminated that. Uh, the upshot of which was that instead of having to buy one motor, if you had two kits, you had to buy two. So that worked out well for us. <laughs> there again is the finished model. You can see it's like not so different than this, which was like a couple weeks into development. Um, you know, here's the finished product. Now that crank in this whole apparatus over here in the corner, which we call the rise gear, this has something called stack up tolerances. So one of the painful things we learned about this is that this wood, although it's specced at, at three millimeters, which is 0.118 uh, thousandths of an inch, it fluctuates by about 10 or 20 thousandths of an inch. That doesn't matter for people that are making furniture, but it mattered a lot for us and it affected the ability to fit parts together with slots and grooves and, and it affects the way the marble travels. So we had to work around that and these guys will point to some of those things. So here's the second iteration. Looks really similar, right? From a consumer standpoint, it's almost no different. But what we changed was we eliminated this entire apparatus, which was a lot of wood and complexity and, and, and customer uh, calls and we changed it to something different, which I'll show you in a minute. The other thing that we did, um, there were steel pins, you can see in the bearing there. That's a steel pin, those pins are expensive. Uh, we buy them by the thousands. We designed that out completely in exchange for a completely wood bearing setup with a little bit of candle wax work better, um, less dependent on the, on the thickness tolerances. Uh, and, and so here's what you can see in the, in the before and after of, of the instruction manual before, this rise gear apparatus, you had to press fit 10 pins into this wheel and there was all kinds of assembly. We eliminated all of that in favor of an entirely different structure that utilized these wood bearings and other types of fits to eliminate the stack up dependence that we had previously. And then another example, um, in the skate park model, there are five of these wheels up top that are again, a press fit with a metal pin that we had to purchase that you know had had stack up tolerances and all kinds of problems and we changed that design to a similar architecture where we've designed out the dependence on the wood thickness uh, because of the way that the fits are designed and we've, we're now using wooden bearings instead of steel pins. We managed to eliminate this entire supplier from, from, this, uh, from this product which resulted in you know, a, a couple, you know, a dollar or two in save cost at our cost which translates to maybe four or five dollars at retail and when you're talking about a 50 or 60 dollar product that's a lot of, that's a lot of cost savings. Okay, so you know, with that, I'm going to hand this off to um, Ayush, and uh, so we, we call these guys either the Ayushas, or to differentiate them, Ayush and Amin, so if I stumble, that's why. I'm going to hand this off to Ayush and Amin, who are going to tell you a little bit about our manufacturing process and show you some photos of the plant. So as Adam showed, uh, product development was like the more glamorous part of the startup. But after the final product design, that's not the end of story. That's not just, uh, the difficult part is not done yet. The difficult part is still there, uh, which is getting your final product in the hands of your consumers. And there's a lot that goes into after the final product gets designed and before it gets into the hands of the actual users. 
Uh, the first of that decisions was, uh, like Adam said, was uh, deciding on between where to manufacturing, uh, manufacture it. Uh, to manufacture it in China or in any other Asian countries would have been the easier choice, but uh, uh, for some reasons, uh, in terms of like cost and uh, stuff, but for this product, it's not something that's uh, that's replicable from uh, other product that, that was out there. So we had some specific uh, constraints, like we uh, we talked about the wood thickness, or if uh, or uh, if the uh, the cuts were not accurate, or if there were some uh, other constraints with the, the with the materials, we uh, needed to make sure that the products that we ship are absolutely good, and a bad product ship could uh, could just ruin the company. So uh, the uh, the decision to uh, make the product in uh, U.S. was made, and uh, uh, that was uh, the beginning of the difficult part. Uh, so a lot went into after making that decision was all from uh, designing uh, the process of your manufacturing, uh, layout planning, uh, which builds more constraint uh, when uh, the costs are high, in, uh, especially in this region, in the States, uh, where you don't hear a lot of big manufacturing, uh, large-scale manufacturing set up around Massachusetts. Uh, the, the, the labor costs are high, the overheads for space and everything else is high. So we were working with a very limited resources uh, everything has to be absolutely uh, lean, and all your manufacturing had to be absolutely lean. Uh, the whole uh, process went through uh, a lot of uh, different challenges, like uh, uh, finding the right equipments and the right fixtures. Uh, one major challenge that a lot of manufacturing face right now is uh, you get a fixture or an equipment, and it becomes obsolete in one year, depending how your process change. So you need to balance out between uh, productivity and, uh, uh, and and how practically that could be implemented. A lot of things that we study theoretically in our books, like just in time, or uh, or eliminating all the eight ways of lean and, uh, and other like industrial engineering jargons. But uh, when you actually implement that, there are more constraints than you realize that you can't control. Uh, a lot of would uh, would depend on your suppliers, so you need to uh, find a balance between. Uh, your uh, theoretical uh, knowledge or uh, the things that you learn from books uh, and uh, when you actually implement them here. But uh, uh, I, 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 what I thought was like keeping the basics in mind and go up with, go with the flow of things as it was going. Uh, we had a lot of, uh, when we started, we had uh, a lot of constraints in terms of uh, we had a bit massive Kickstarter order that had to be met in a couple of months. So, so finding out the right labor to do that, uh, we came up with a, uh, Adam came up with a cool program where he uh, hired a bunch of high school assemblers, high school students. Uh, our factory is very close to the local high school in Beverly, where we hired the high school students. And, uh, and uh, it was a pretty cool idea uh, because uh, the high school students don't care about uh, the wage as much as like a, uh, like a grown adult would do hiring like uh, someone, someone uh, gr like a grown up to do assembly work, which could be pretty boring, uh, putting parts in a bag, uh, was more fun for, uh, for, for a high school student. They l loved the product, the toy. Uh, we ca came up with like a good motivation uh, uh, system, which kept them engaging and kept things going. Uh, next couple of slides, we have how the, the factory uh, developed. This is uh, the picture of the first laser as it got into the shop, and then the first uh, Kickstarter order that, order that uh, we shipped. Yeah. Uh, so after uh, uh, we had like a defined process, uh, still, uh, so, uh, uh, one thing that I realized was that, uh, uh, things never get easier uh, while you work, uh, uh, when you're working in a company. Uh, there's always new challenges. So once we have uh, the manufacturing set up, uh, now the, the next challenge is just to keep producing consistently thousands of units at a good quality and at the right cost. Um. Yeah, so to build further on what Ayush just said, you set up your operation, you have all your suppliers lined out, you have your material, equipment, so what's the next step? Now, next step is getting all those components online at a rate which makes sense. You want to keep your quality high. You want to reduce the number of defects that you encounter. 
which is all more difficult than it sounds like. Uh, also, one key uh, component was establishing like a reliable process. By reliable, I mean that you have clear and practical goals and expectations set, which are easy to gather, which translate into data, which are communicable to, say, our high school assemblers. Like, they are uh, ultimately also adding to the product. So it was essential to keep things simple while gathering the necessary data. You also want to make sure that you're producing at a, at a rate that makes sense, that makes the operation feasible. But the other constraint is that we're in the toy industry, so it's a seasonal demand cycle. Right now is our peak season, the holidays are coming up, and then it kind of finds down, it rises up again. So to meet that demand, you need to keep balancing your production accordingly. Um, there are certain constraints that you'll find yourself with. There are space constraints, the availability of labor, and another uh, bunch of things that uh, you know rise up as you keep going along, kind of like you'll do in your projects. You'll have clear goals set up. You want to meet those deadlines. You want to build on your idea and get an end product together at the same time keeping your cost low and meeting your objective. That is exactly what we were trying to do and that was one of the interesting projects on my part that I got to work with and I'm still working with that. Another interesting thing is we try to achieve a just-in-time system which means we try not to hold out inventory in our space, rather order raw materials just in time and manufacture that and get it to the retailer as soon as possible, reducing the time that the product spends on the shop floor. So those are some of the aspects that I got to work with. Um, next, I have how our space kind of evolved, how we tackle problems. Now, this is when I joined. Like You can see that we have three lasers there. Uh, we're using what we have. We store parts in boxes stuff like that. But as we go along in fast forward to present day, we have a more sophisticated system. You can see the custom venting back there. We have five lasers now. We have boxes or carts to move parts along. It's kind of been a learning curve. And it's been great to see how we got from point A to where we are right now. And this is when we got our two additional lasers in the facility. <laughs> and this is just a visit from our local uh, preschool where kids were just in to see what we're doing, get a feel of the lasers. And this is our present day plan, yeah. Thanks. Um, great, so we're, we have 10 minutes for questions. You know, I never know how to end these things. People end these things with quotations. Um, when I joined the, the startup in uh, Cambridge, the MIT guy that founded that had this top quote on the wall, um, stuck with me uh, ever since. Far better it is to dare mighty things to win glory of triumphs, even though checkered by failure, than to take rank with those poor spirits who neither enjoy much nor suffer much because they live in the gray twilight that knows neither victory nor defeat. Anyone know who said that? That was Theodore Roosevelt. Um, it was later paraphrased by unknown uh, uh, into uh, go big or go home, right? <laughs> That's the gist. And the second quote's easier, um, and I'm not going to do the impersonation, but we choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Anyone know that one? Yeah, so everyone knows that one. It's a terrific speech if you haven't seen it. Um, and this, this quote actually goes on to say, you know, there's a challenge, we're going to rise to it, nothing's going to stop us, and we're going to win. Um, but I like this part. I like, I like the not because it's easy, because it's hard part. Because it doesn't say because we have a particular objective or because we want to do this or that. It's like, you know what, we're going to do this just because we're going to do it. The mountain's there, we're going to climb it. Um, and, and that's what I took away from that quote. So um, with that, next slide. We have... Um, Time for a Q&A, and we'll take some questions from the audience. You can write this coupon code down if you'd like to buy one of, our, uh, one of the products from the website at marbelocity.com. There are also some 
you know, we just, you can take these with you. They have the coupon code on them. They're little laser cut tokens uh, just to show you what the material looks like and smells like. Make sure you grab one. Um, with that, can we take a couple of questions in the back? <laughs> Pretty technical question. Um, when do you guys want to take this? So, uh, like you said, you need to find a balance between not meeting your orders and having enough. So, we worked with lead times from our different supplier. It just gathered the lead times and order product according to what we forecasted that we would produce. So, just to kind of match exactly what we ha would need and exactly what we would order. Um, does that answer your question somewhat, or? That's a great question. Uh, the question is basically like, you know, clearly nobody just drops what they're doing without a plan and starts being an entrepreneur. There's an overlap period. And uh, for me, I mean, you have to, in some ways, you have to seize the other, seize the opportunity if it presents itself. In other ways, you have to, you have to create that opportunity. In the first instance, the writing was on the wall for this startup. Um, and there was a wind down period of about six months where like clearly we weren't going to make it. Um, so what I started doing in that period was I started thinking about what I wanted to do next. Um, you know, there's different schools of thoughts on this today, but at the time I wrote a patent uh, for the uh, for the never late alarm cock. I got thinking about the, the the product. I did some consumer research. Back then, I remember I did a survey. I did a user survey. I I, uh, I literally I went to some university website, typed in John Smith, and at the time it would list all the emails, and I found some bot that would scrape emails out of a HTML page, and that's how I created my my marketing list. I mean, it's easier to do today, but back then you had to be kind of scrappy. Um, so you do that for a period of time, and I think it's important to do both because you can't like kind of stop what you're doing to do the next thing until you're confident that it's going to be able to go forward. But at some point, you have to kind of like I don't want to use the expression, you know, blank or get off the pot, but you have to kind of do that. And you have to, you have to commit. You have to say, you know what, I've taken this to about as far as I can, and you have to jump. You know, maybe you. In my case, for the first company, I, I borrowed $30,000 from my parents. And then I got an SBA loan for another 90. That's how I, fun that's how I funded the company. Um, that, was a big, that was a big decision, right? So you know, my parents were happy to lend me the money, luckily. Um, but you know, at, at some point, I'm exposed for over 100, 100 grand. Um, you know, the government's really going to want that back, and my parents probably would have forgiven it. You know, ultimately it worked out, but I had to say, you know what, this is the moment that I'm going to take the leap. So it's a little bit of both. Great question. So now that we were acquired by a larger company, what does that mean? Well, that's one of the reasons that we wanted to be acquired by the larger company. And the acquisition of the fourth and fifth lasers were able to take place subsequent to the acquisition immediately because of that, because this is, this is a bigger company that has deeper pockets. Um, and so the, the, the vision for uh, Play Monster is, you know, A, you got to start by expanding on <clears throat> what you're doing. But yes, we have, we have future plans to do products that are outside of marble coasters, so to speak. Um, um, you know, I won't give you the details, but there's a movie that's going to be coming out in, uh, it was supposed to be last next year, it's going to be 2019, uh, that's very kind of coincidentally relevant to what we do. We have a license to that now. We're going to be developing toys surrounding that movie. So there's, there's, there's opportunities that present itself. So there's a point in time when it may or may not make sense to sell 
the, the company that you've created to a larger entity. And, and that's a discussion for another day, but that's a really big, important, complex topic, particularly for somebody who has created something you know, from scratch that was their baby for a long period of time. Other questions? Okay, great question. Um, so I think the fatal mistake that most Kickstarter uh, creators make is that you know they plan a timeline based on some speculation about success. Hopefully, I mean in my mind, our 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 our, our raise goal was set at fourteen thousand dollars. We met that in a day, and ultimately we raised one hundred and thirty thousand dollars. And we probably could have done more, but we ran out of time. The thing was still accelerating as as our thirty days ran out. So ultimately, we had 1,535 backers and some, how many thousands of units? Almost 4,000. Almost 4,000 units. And originally, we were going to do this with like one laser cutter, you know, <laughs> it's, right? So it quickly becomes a problem. And luckily, and like, this was very difficult. And I'm a guy that has had extensive manufacturing experience and knew how to do this, right? So imagine if you're just Joe whoever you invented this thing. You know, you're like, oh, no problem, I'll buy a laser cutter, put it in my garage, and we'll knock these things out. And then all of a sudden, you have 4,000 orders, or, or worse, I mean, there's, or worse or better. I mean, there's been a number of Kickstarters even recently that have raised over a million dollars, you know, 18,000 backers. You know, it, it's, it can really get out of hand quickly. So it was very painful, and it took a very long time to get those Kickstarter orders out, out the door. Today, um, I'll pass it off to Ayush, you want to talk about our throughput today? Uh, we grew uh, to like about 9,000 units. We uh, take them as a normalized unit. Different kits produce at different throughput rate. So in total, we produce about 9,000 normalized production per month. Or per month. Per month. Yeah. So that, uh, that doesn't mean that 9,000 absolute units. Uh, the larger model takes a lot more time than the smaller models, but at hi our highest capacities these months, we are actually growing every month. So these months, we are producing 9,000. So we could produce 9,000. Well, you know, we got an order for this, or Toys R Us want that, or, you know, so we can produce obviously fewer of these. Producing one of these is something like 2.3 times as difficult as producing one of those, but we call it a normalized unit. So our throughput's 9,000 pieces, and it took a long time to get there. And our operation, thanks to these guys, works pretty nicely today. I mean, it went from like literally Krista and I QC'd every single box that went out in the first year of operation, the two of us. I recruited friends for burgers and beers to like do assembly. Like it, it was, it was, it was somewhat painful. Uh, it's better today. Anyone else? Okay, great. Well, we're right on time. Uh, we'll be down here for a couple of minutes. And thanks so much for the opportunity. Yes, thank you, um, Tinky Air. So um, those of you that have the purple slips, if you want to give them to a faculty member outside. We've got some faculty members to collect them. If you want one of the laser cut little business cards, promo codes, come on up. Come meet the Tinkineers. Thank you, everybody, for coming. I found more purple slips if you need one. Blank purple slips for attendance if you need one. Come on up to the front. Oh, and an extra packet. So we got plenty of purple slips if you need one. Come on up and get a.
Good job. Thank you. 